Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to our Michigan Game Day show for the national championship game on Monday night. Which sounds nice, doesn't it? I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. I'm behind this week like everyone covering Michigan and Washington because everyone is scrambling to get down to Houston. So today we'll be joined by Clayton Safey from the Wolverine on 3 and tomorrow Husky sideline reporter Elise Woodward will be with us on our Visitors Edition. Before Clayton jumps on, we'll hear some interesting thoughts on the game from Joel Platt from his show earlier today concerning the keys to victory for Michigan and his pick in the game. First, let's get started with a very brief view from Section 17. I don't know about you, but I'm still exhausted from that epic Rose Bowl game on Monday. I can't remember watching a more stressful final Michigan drive and then the overtime, which was a classic. We will have all winter, heck, the rest of our lives to savor that game. In the meantime, there is one last piece of business to take care of. I like how we match up with Washington. They are scary on offense with Michael Penix, no doubt, but I think Jesse Minter and our defense will slow them down at least some. I also like how we match up with the Huskies' defense. They are a bend-but-don't-break kind of D that we are built to play against. I expect us to run the ball effectively, use the passing game smartly, eat up clock, and score points on these guys. If we can do that, we will limit their possessions, and they will be playing our game. This is a great matchup for us, much better than Alabama. It should be another nerve-wracker, though, but what a glorious night it could end up in Houston. On his show today, Joel Klatt said the key for Michigan is making Michael Penix uncomfortable. The linebackers are going to have to play a, a big role in this matchup for, for for Michigan, but mainly it's going to be about the defensive line's ability to make Penix uncomfortable. Now, I chose those words carefully because it's not just about sacks. Penix excels with accuracy, pitch selection, and leverage. So Michigan's going to have to make him uncomfortable and in particular, push the pocket right back into his lap. I think that is the most important piece of Michigan's defensive game plan. Can the tackles do that? Now, it just so happens that's exactly how they're built. Joel said Penix has to be elite in this game to beat Michigan. I think it's imperative from Michigan's standpoint that they get pressure internal, that they limit possessions. It's imperative that Penix plays out of his mind. There's no other way that Washington can win this game. Penix is going to have to play great. They've got one lane to win this one. I think Michigan's got three or four lanes that they could possibly drive in order to win this game. Washington has one. The passing game is going to have to be elite, 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 elite. And guess what? It can be that because Michael Penix is, is that dude. In the end, he sees a Michigan victory. My official pick is going to be Michigan. I think Michigan wins this team, this program, ever since COVID, was built specifically to beat Ohio State. And they will be facing maybe a better version, but a version of Ohio State. 
My guest today says, enjoy the Bama win for another few days and get ready for a barn burner in the national championship game. Joining us next is Clayton Safey from the Wolverine on 3. I forgot to hit the record button for the intro, so we'll pick it up with Clayton describing the scene in Pasadena as the game ended. So stay with us. was just epic i mean i mean rose petals and confetti were flying everywhere and the goalpost came down as soon as the game ended and the stage comes out and roses were in the mouths and, and you know smiles were on the faces everything that went into getting that win and celebrating that win uh was a lot but this team has to now turn around and play the short turnaround uh mike because usually it's eight or nine days in between these games sometimes I think it's even been 10 or 11 a couple times just based on how the schedule and the, the calendar has played out. But since the Rose Bowl has to be on New Year's Day, and then they pair the other semifinal with that, and it happened to fall on a Monday, and they like to play the national championship game on a Monday, this is only a week in between. So uh, you had Washington having to go from New Orleans back home and then down to Houston, Michigan back from Los Angeles and then down to Houston. So it, that kind of cuts into your preparation time as well. It's a good problem to have. It's certainly the problem that you hope for. Jesse Mitter told me that after the game, but it is uh, it is something that you're going to have to guard against, you know, worrying too much about uh, what you did instead of looking ahead to what you have to do. I would liken it, though, to an experience Michigan's familiar with over the last few years, beating Ohio State. I mean, nothing's more emotionally high than that. And you, then you have to come back a week later and play in the Big Ten championship game. So I think that's an experience these guys can draw on. Uh, Washington – had the same type of thing. They had a rivalry game and then went and had to play Oregon in the biggest game of their year to that point, in the uh, Pac-12 championship. So I think both teams will be ready. I think uh, when you talk to these Michigan players, they keep keep giving that Kobe Bryant line, you know, the job's not finished. So they understand. They, they didn't come here this time to just win one. I think that was a huge monkey off the back. But now they now they want to win the next one. And and uh, you do that, and you get, you're 15-0. I mean, it'll probably be the best team in Michigan history. Well, there's so much to talk about right now. But for starters, just for a few minutes, let's go back to Monday and the Rose mm-hmm. Bowl because it was so glorious. And I'm still amazed at the offensive game plan and how it confused Alabama. I mean, Sharon Moore, and I'm sure Jim Harbaugh had his uh, fingers in that. They just had a brilliant game plan, didn't they? They did. And, I, you know, I just got done talking about this on our podcast as well. Uh, because I rewatched the game and we were discussing, all right, a few days have passed. You've rewatched things. You've looked at it a little bit more closely. And now what is the most impressive part of this game? And to me, it was the coaching, uh, you know, the way Michigan came out and threw different things at Alabama, like you said, that they didn't expect, you know, it's interesting with these bowl games because you have a month to prepare. So in theory, you don't know any opponent throughout the year better than you're going to know this opponent. Right. Mm-hmm. But with that month, knowing that the other team has a month, you're going to throw in some new things. And both teams did that. I think Michigan did it much more and much better than Alabama. And I think Jim Harbaugh and his staff outcoached Nick Saban and his staff. But let's let's just think back to Michigan's first scoring drive in this game. All the different wrinkles that they pulled out on that. I believe that was the one where Kalel Mullins catches pass. He's a guy that's come in and been a short yardage guy and a blocking back. And, and I do love what he brings in those areas. But then they throw a pass to him. Then Blake Corum, when it was second down, they could have gotten the first. It wasn't second and goal, but they were inside the 10 there. And I I was thinking to myself, and I said out loud to Chris Ballas next to me, I said, run Blake here. Well, they sneak him out of the backfield and throw a touchdown to him. And, you know, that's the type of thing they haven't done with Blake Corum this year. So they were able to get him open. That was one of the first of many times in this game as well that Sharon Moore was able to get his running backs and his slot receivers matched up with Alabama's linebackers. 
Alabama's linebackers were targeted in coverage six times. They allowed six receptions for 82 yards and three touchdowns. Roman Wilson had a linebacker on him on the final touchdown. Blake on that touchdown that I just mentioned. And Tyler Morris had Deontay Lawson, number 32, on him on his uh, 38-yard touchdown. So what Sharon Moore did to get his guys in favorable matchups in a game in which the other team has better athletes than you, I thought was masterful. Obviously, Jim Harbaugh, the rest of the staff had a hand in that. And then Jesse Minter, the different fronts and blitzes and then the coverages subsequently that he was able to throw at Jalen Milrow was incredible. And to get to him early, and I think Jesse Minter knew they had to do that. I want to ask him about this this weekend when we get to talk to him. Uh, but to get to him early, I think he, he understood that they had to do that to make him uncomfortable, to you know take some confidence away from that Alabama offensive line going into the rest of the game. Uh, so they executed exactly what they wanted to do. There were portions of this game that did not go the way Michigan wanted it to, but then obviously at the end, we, I'm sure that's, that's almost a different, almost felt like a different game in a way, the last drive and then the, the way things finished out in overtime. But uh, obviously, credit to the players and everybody for staying with it there because things didn't go all that well for the offense in the second half until then, and then they made the plays they had to. They really needed it on the fourth down and at the goal line, and then in overtime, they made those plays when they had to, and, and that's what was so incredible about this victory. Yeah, and I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a worry ward about a lot of things, or I was going into that game, and one of the biggest worries for me was the offensive line and how they would handle that Bama front, especially right. the right. reshuffled offensive line. But other than that patch in the second half where uh, they were struggling, they were very, very good, weren't they? They were. And, you know, look, you're playing without a unanimous All-American in Zach Vinter, and you're playing with a guy at guard who's played tackle most of the year. And honestly, guard is probably the best spot for Carson Barnhart. He's going to the NFL, he said, after this year. And I think he goes in there as a guard prospect, right? But Trent A. Jones comes in at right tackle, a guy that, you know, has been really close to kind of securing a full-time starting job, but just hasn't quite done it yet during his Michigan career. He had it in 2022 until he got hurt. So, I mean, it, it's a drop-off, right, when you don't have a unanimous All-American out there. Oh, but yeah. the way those guys play, the way Drake Nugent played, I thought Trevor Keegan from the beginning as well, a lot of those key plays on that first touchdown scoring drive that we just talked about, uh, Trevor Keegan blew his guy back. He was out pulling, leading the way. And you needed that out of your most experienced, your best leader uh, on the offensive line early on in the game. Michigan set the tone on both lines that they were going to dominate the line of scrimmage. They did that most of the game. and then. Uh, but you're right. I mean, J.J. McCarthy was kept clean most of the day. Uh, they got the ball out quick in, in other uh, situations as well. And that allowed them to have a chance because those are great athletes on the other side, great edge rushers fantastic cornerbacks that Alabama has, but Michigan was able to find ways to move the football in not, not a overly traditional sense, but just kind of picking, picking their spots here and there. And then the gadget plays when they needed them, it really should have hit the flea flicker as well, but uh, they just kind of had everything when they needed it, but it starts up front. No question. And JJ uh, got off to a somewhat of a shaky start, uh, got away with one that, uh, you know, should have been an interception. Luckily uh, the defensive backs back and his uh, cleats were uh, out of bounds, but Hey, we'll take it. But he seemed nervous uh, in the early going, didn't he Clayton? I mean, I I could not believe that first pass. Like I I just couldn't believe it. I was like, this is, (laughs) I mean, this is TCU like all over again, kind of, and really even, I mean, really one of the TCU pick sixes was just kind of a, a pass like he didn't see the guy or whatever. So it's not like that was nerves or anything. But you know, you just felt like he was going to play differently this time. He ended up doing that. But the first play was, was just absolutely wild that, that that happened. And fortunately for Michigan, he was out of bounds before it. Um, so you get a chance to regroup a little bit. And I thought, which is funny, because it definitely seemed like nerves. And he could have thrown that ball earlier and everything else and then he throw, trying to throw it away. I think really one of the biggest things J.J. McCarthy did in this game was stay positive, stay calm. Uh, you know, before that final drive with 4.39 to go, the TV camera shows J.J. McCarthy walk past Jim Harbaugh on the sideline. They didn't exchange a single word. They fist bumped and gave each other a nod where it's like, okay, we know exactly what the mission is here. We know what we have to do. So J.J. McCarthy, I know Jim Harbaugh has talked about it for a couple of years now, how he's unflappable. And I think he was – part of him was trying to almost speak that into existence over the last couple of years, uh, but it was never more 
um, you know, evident than in that moment, the way he was able to lead the team down on the touchdown drive. But he made other big plays. I mean, the catch he made on the double pass from Donovan Edwards to then throw it as he's getting clobbered by Dallas Turner to Roman Wilson in, in other plays. I mean, he had a couple drops by his receivers. But J.J. McCarthy, with the ball in his hands at the end, showed that he was the better quarterback in this game. And really a couple other third downs, too, I thought were the difference where Michigan trusted him to make the play and Alabama didn't trust Jalen Milrow. So sometimes you you know, you know don't want to oversimplify things by saying the better quarterback is going to win the game. But it's kind of what happened in this one, even though there were so many other factors at play. But at the end of the day, it was number nine that was able to lead his team down to tie the game and send it to overtime. There is no question J.J. was clutch when he had to be in a drive we'll, we'll remember forever. Also clutch, Blake Corum. I mean, catching the big passes uh, out of the backfield, the 18-yard touchdown run in overtime, the great pass blocking, which I think gets overlooked a lot, and then, in general, yeah. the leadership. I mean, that was the kind of performance that we will remember forever, isn't it, Clayton? I said it at the time, after he scored, I said I, I would say he just became a legend, but Blake Corum's been a legend, <laughs> and he just keeps adding – to his legend status with all these games. And, you know, you think of the Penn State run late to clinch that one. Uh, and this is taken out even last year and all the things he did there. But, you know, he had the game clincher against Penn State. Then he has the one after the Zach Zinter injury against Ohio State. I mean, legendary moments, but nothing bigger than what he did on that run, which was an insane jump cut and then just absolute will to get into the end zone and rumble and, you know, keep this balance. I mean, it was, I mean, that's one of my favorite runs of all time already. And again, I mean, it's just one more thing that Blake Corum has done, but Mike, I'll, I'll say this, like coming into the game and I, I'm guilty of it too, I think, but there was so much talk about how's Michigan going to, going to handle Jalen Milrow and the SEC speed and the SEC physicality and Nick Saban, but no one in, in there was some talk about which quarterback's going to play better. But no one really talked about Blake Corum. Everyone just kind of lumped him in with, yeah, the Michigan run game. It's been pretty good. And Blake Corum is an elite running back. I think he's the best running back, in my opinion, in the country. I think he has been two straight years or right up there. You could you could say Bajan Robinson last year. But no one talked about that. But at the end of the day, he was probably the best player on the field when it mattered, right up there with, you know, J.J. McCarthy and Roman Wilson on a couple of plays. But number two, was uh, was one of the best players out there, and he showed that at the end. He was not going to be denied, and he wasn't denied. And, man, the fact that we get one more chance to watch him on Monday night do what he came back to do. I mean, I was there on the field at the Fiesta Bowl last year kind of following him around and taking a couple of videos as he crutched around and signed autographs for Michigan fans who were chanting one more year, one more year. Well, he comes back for another year for this, and now he's got his team right where he wants them. Oh, absolutely. He had a smiling uh at the end of the game on Monday night, and yeah. hopefully the same thing uh, this coming Monday night. Another thing that I think had us all smiling, and you alluded to this earlier, was how the defense started the game, and then the entire defensive performance the rest of the way. Jesse Minter put on a master class on how to defend Alabama, didn't he? He sure did. Everything about this defensive performance was a master class. I mean, when you think of, it's funny because throughout the year, a couple of times we're like, there'll be Cam Good in there or Rayshon Benny in there to start a drive. And I would kind of say like, yeah, I mean, you got Kenneth Grant, Chris Jenkins and Mason Graham. Like they just, you know, watch the offense go on a five minute drive. I mean, you really need the backups in at this time. But the fact that they developed that depth, knowing that at some point they were going to need it. Uh, and then they needed it against Alabama where they're rotating fresh guys in and out. I mean, the, the final stop, there was Josiah Stewart is in there. He's not a starter. Derek Moore was in there. He's not a starter. Uh, you know, maybe one more guy that, that, that is more of a rotational guy. They needed all hands on deck up front, and they got big performances, big performances from all of them. Derek Moore, Josiah Stewart, Braden McGregor, Jalen Harrell, obviously, but KG, Mason Graham, Chris Jenkins, Cam Good. I mean, that's a lot of guys. Like, other teams don't rotate that much, so – to me, watching that game, that stood out to me. But the linebackers, the way they ran, the way that the secondary open field tackled, especially after the, the long run early on where Mikey Sane was still uh, missed on that tackle, but the coverage as well. I mean, everything worked together perfectly in unison. And one of the things that these players talked about coming off of 
last year was that they felt like the defense was very good, but it wasn't always in sync and they weren't always connected with each other from interior D line to the edges to the D line to the linebackers, you know, that sort of thing. But it just felt like something that they wanted to fix, something that they did fix, and that's something that, you know, really paid off in this game. But I mean, what Jesse Minter did with some of the creative blitzes and different looks to try to confuse Jalen Milrow was uh, was fantastic. And Milrow said before the game, too, that, you know, nothing Michigan will throw at him will be something he hasn't seen in the SEC. I beg to differ a little <laughs> bit, I would say. I think Jesse Minter was probably licking his chops there when he heard that comment. Of course, it got, got brought up back on social media after the game, but uh, long-winded way of saying that uh, Jesse Minter and that defense, the whole staff did a wonderful job. No question about it. And sticking with that all defensive line for just another minute, I, last week, you know, in prepping and getting ready for the game, I was talking to, um, you know, several of the Alabama beat writers, a couple of their podcasters, and they were asking mm-hmm. a lot of questions about the defensive line. And, you know, a couple of them said, hey, we know D-line is good, but look who they played against in, in the Big Ten. But, you know, the day after we can say with assurance is that, yeah, that defensive line, you thought they were good. You now know they are good. That is an elite front. It is. And it's interesting because I think part of it is like when you're, especially if you're on the Alabama side, maybe you didn't watch Michigan all year. You're kind of trying to look at the stats, right? Like, okay, where's the one guy? Where's the Aiden Hutchinson or the David Ajabo or whatever it is that has 10 sacks or 15 or, you know, eight net 14 that year. Um, there isn't that guy. And honestly, you know, part of me throughout the year too question how good this D line was because, you know, sometimes you, you do want that one player that the other team has to scheme to take away. Then it frees up other guys, that sort of thing. But to me, this D line is great because it, it plays together because I think they're stronger at interior defensive line than I've probably ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, and it, that really, too, Mike, when you think back to when Michigan uh, last played Alabama, January 1, 2020, just fate, no disrespect to him, but just fate started that game at, at defensive tackle. You know, earlier that season, Mace, uh, not Mason Graham, uh, Ben Mason, you know, moved from fullback to defensive tackle. The position group that has improved the most since Michigan played Alabama in, in, you know, to start 2020 to now is defensive tackle. And that's a huge position to you know, have as a strength if you're going to go up against these SEC teams. Michigan has been able to close the gap with these guys. Alabama has, according to one metric, the second most talented roster of all time this season. But it was Michigan that, that looked like they had more dudes out there and you know, looked like the better team on Monday. So credit the coaches, the development, all of that. But uh, also just the way those guys played uh, and, and including on the defensive line. So you, you can't hang with the Alabamas and the Georgias if you're not strong at the line of scrimmage. And even from two years ago, I think of the difference in, in Michigan's D-line uh, overall. You know, I know you had Aiden, but when they face Georgia compared to now, I think it's it's a significant increase in, in talent and the way they're developed. So uh, another long-winded way, way of saying that, you know, I mean, the, the D-line was such a big key in that. Yeah, and I thought it was uh, funny the day after the game, Clayton, when, you know, some in the media, a lot of them from uh, the SEC were saying, you know, Michigan's good, but this is the worst Saban team in the last 15 years. <laughs> you know, you got to hear a lot of that. But for Michigan, you know, nothing can cheapen that win and what it means to the program, can it? No, not at all. And, I know, you know, now that they're in the national championship, you're getting even more noise and even more talk because, some people nationally are just now honing back in on Michigan. Um, obviously, the cheating stuff, the, you know, the talk that they're gonna they're gonna say. I mean, it, it's look. I mean, look what they've done down the stretch this season, including in a few games without their head coach. That, that's one thing. And then two, to go back kind of to what your point was, uh, you're still playing Nick Saban. Like I said, the, the metric that says this, according to you know, on paper recruiting rankings and, and all that is one of the most talented rosters in the history of college football. So this is still Alabama. And this is, look, one day before the game, everyone was talking about how Michigan should be the underdog. And this is still Nick Saban. And they have a lot of talent. And Milrow was a Heisman, you know, top number six in the Heisman voting. And that this team's red hot. And that they're not the same team that played Texas earlier in the year. 
I could go on and on and on. But then the day after the game, they're trying to make the excuses. You can't have it both ways. Michigan played a, probably a C game in terms of execution and really almost blew that game based on how much they dominated it in the first half. But at the end, it was Nick Saban standing on one sideline, Michigan driving down, scoring, and winning in overtime. Uh, and it was so epic, and, and, you know, as we've kind of talked about. So, no, uh, you know, nobody can take this one away from them. For Absolutely sure. And not. Michigan fans will remember it forever. Yes, yep. it was a thing of beauty. And now we have uh, Monday night in Houston, uh, Michigan against Washington for the national championship. And when you think of the Huskies, at least me anyway, uh, Michael Penix uh, jumps out at you. And this is not the same quarterback we saw uh, during those many injury-riddled Big Ten years. He has become, arguably, the most dangerous quarterback in college football, hasn't he, Clayton? He has, and he had terrible luck early in his career. I mean, four straight years of having season-ending injuries, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And he was good, you know, in those times. And I think he was especially good when Kalen DeBoer, now his head coach, was his offensive coordinator at Indiana. So those two have been a lethal pairing. Um, obviously, what they've done. And then you you uh, combine that with elite wide receiver play. I mean, three NFL wide receivers on that offense and the Joe Moore award-winning offensive line to protect him. Uh, then I think you're looking at a really potent offense, clearly. Uh, they've only had 11 sacks surrendered all year long on 522 passes. That's remarkable. Uh, you know, so, look, Texas has a fantastic off, uh, defensive line, excuse me, Similar to Michigan, really. Built similar, you know, with some really big and, and fantastic defensive tackles. But, um, you know, so – but Texas wasn't able to do a ton against that Washington O-line. This Michigan defensive line that we just talked about at length, you know, has a big challenge ahead of them because you got to pressure him. You know, you look at the defensive backfield, it's going to be a big challenge for them as well against the, these Washington receivers. Romo Dunze – is uh, is one of the best in the country with, I believe, over 1,500 yards. I look at it, and I thought Mason Graham had a, a really good comment on Wednesday when he wasn't even here at the time, but he said that they're kind of drawn back to 2021 Ohio State when they had all those receivers, great quarterback in C.J. Stroud, and how they had to contain them. So the one thing that works in Michigan's favor here is that they are kind of built, and they prepare year-round for Ohio State, which has – a similar style to Washington. So now they can kind of, you know, ditch the Alabama game plan, which was completely different playing against a mobile quarterback and go back into maybe what they did against Ohio state. So uh, it's going to be a, a really interesting game because Washington wants to play this one in the forties or fifties. Michigan wants to play this one in the twenties or thirties. So it'll be kind of fascinating to see uh, what the game flow kind of looks like. Yeah. And when we, when we think about uh, this Washington team, or even if we you know had a chance to see them this year, I mean, the passing game is, is what you remember and what scares you, but this Huskies offense is even more dangerous in that they just are not a passing team. I mean, these guys can run the ball and Dylan Johnson went over uh, 1000 yards this year. He's a dangerous, very dangerous back. Uh, but even if he plays, it looks like he's dinged up, isn't he, Clayton? Yeah, and that's that's one of the key storylines going into this one and maybe a little bit of gamesmanship being played by Washington and Kalen DeBoer saying that he expects that he will play. Now, he's been playing banged up for a while, but he gets carted off there at the end, which ironically stopped the clock, gave Texas time on their final drive to take you know several shots into the end zone. Um, you know, so that was just kind of something that, that really caused them almost to, to blow the Texas team. But he's rushed for, you know, I mean, you said the number, well over 1,000 yards. Nobody else on their team has rushed, I believe, for over 200 yards. So yeah. he has been their running game, um, and, and that would be a significant loss. So I don't think even if he plays, he's going to be anywhere near 100%. And if that could make them more one-dimensional, we know Michigan, really their first priority is to stop the run. So that's going to be their goal anyway. But if they can play one-dimensional, uh, then I think Michigan could be set up a little bit better defensively. And going back to you know what we said with the way Jesse Minter mixes things up and throws different looks at opposing quarterbacks that they haven't seen before. Penix has seen a lot. He's been in college football, I think, six years. Uh, but I think Jesse Minter has an opportunity here to to you know prove his worth again in another biggest game ever, you know, biggest game of his career. And uh, so we'll, we'll kind of see what game plan he comes up with. Yeah, I'm already excited to see what uh, Jesse throws at them on Monday. But another impressive aspect of this offense is that they, you mentioned it, they have that Joe Moore award-winning offensive line. They've only allowed 11 sacks and over 500 passing attempts. 
I think a lot of that is because Penix gets rid of the ball really quickly too. Right. But it it sets up a fascinating matchup with that Michigan front, doesn't it? It does. And I think, again, going, you know, I know we've talked a lot about Minter in this show, but Jesse Minter, and, you know, maybe you won't beat them in some of these one-on-ones, but can they use some of those stunts and twists? And, you know, whether it's bringing more than four guys on a blitz or not, but just the, the creativity where they don't know who's coming where, right, is kind of one of the big things with this Raven-style defense that Michigan runs. So it's going to be important for Michigan to get that going and try to confuse them a little bit. If you can keep, confuse the offensive line and, you know, they don't know where a guy's coming and maybe you get a free rusher like Michigan was able to get a couple times against Alabama, then you can start to confuse the quarterback as well because then he doesn't know where the rush is coming from either. So that's going to be really important. But this O-line, you know, Tavondre Sweat is probably the best defensive tackle in the country for Texas. He didn't do a whole lot against Washington. They were able to just kind of stuff him inside. So it's not going to be easy by any means. And Michigan's going to have to be able to find a way to get pressure because you don't want to have to cover these wide receivers for more than a few seconds. You know, last week at this time, though, I was nervous about how the Michigan offense was going to do against that Alabama defense. I could be right. I could be wrong. I'm not nearly as worried this week about that Washington defense. I know they've come up clutch uh, and they're a bend, but don't break kind of a defense. But I feel really good that Michigan is going to move the ball on these guys. Don't you, Clayton? Yeah, I do too. And I I think specifically it'll be on the ground. You know, well, Washington's really good in the trenches on the offensive side. Their D-line is a little bit closer to average. And when Washington has played teams that are more comparable to a Michigan in terms of talent, in terms of, you know, especially talent up front, those teams have been able to run the ball on them. Uh, You look at Oregon the first time they played, over 200 yards, a couple touchdowns, 5.1 yards per carry. Oregon the second time they played them, 6.2 yards per carry. Texas in this last game uh, just a couple days ago, 6.4 yards per carry, three touchdowns on the ground. You know, USC was able to run on them, other teams as well. So I think it's going to start there. It's going to be another Blake Corum type of game. It's going to have to be a, a good game plan by Michigan as well to mix things up, play action, that sort of thing. But I, I do think that Michigan should be able to move the football much better than it did against Alabama, especially in the second half until the final drive. And uh, that's going to be important because Washington is probably going to be able to score a little bit more on Michigan than Alabama did too. So, you know, we may be looking at a 38-35 or, you know, God forbid, I, I feel like Washington would, would like this, but, you know, a 42-41 type of thing. Michigan's offense has to be able to answer. Uh, the defense isn't going to be able to get a stop every single time. So it's going to be important that they have a higher level of execution than they did in this last game because, uh, you know, the margin is going to be small. Where if Washington can score quick and, and you don't answer, you could find yourself down 14 in a hurry. And you mentioned uh, this should be a big game for Blake. We expect that it will be. And J.J. McCarthy, I mean, watching this Washington defense, you've got to think the tight ends are going to be more involved uh, this week. It's going to be there for them, but it would be great if J.J. got off to a quick start, but he needs to play big. Yeah, it would be. It'll be interesting to see, too, what kind of nerves uh, both sides have, and including with the quarterbacks and, and J.J., um, you know, just because this is a different stage, you know, maybe playing on the big stage in the semis just a week before will kind of ease things. But JJ's got to start fast. The receivers can't be dropping any passes. Uh, we saw a couple key drops in this past game, especially the one uh, to Maj Morgan. Um, but JJ's got to be on point. And, and like I said, I mean, I, I think that this team may have to put up 38 points on offense to win. And that means you're going to have to be good for 60 minutes. You can't have any lulls. But like you, astutely pointed out this defense is is much easier to play against I think maybe not much easier but easier to play against than than Alabama so I think it's just going to be a completely different game and uh, you know Michigan definitely used their bag bag of tricks there in the Alabama game they're going to have to find uh, you know a couple other wrinkles that they can use but it is interesting too with this game where you only have a week to prepare so the other team doesn't know you as well as you know maybe they would if it was a bowl game so uh, it just kind of it fascinates me to see like maybe what kind of game plan we're going to get from each side because I feel like you're going to play this one a little bit more straight up. I know you had analysts looking ahead and, and you know giving them a nice scouting report once the game on Monday ended, but it's just a, a different setup than a bowl game. Much bigger setup uh, than a bowl game. So final question uh, before we let you get away, though, Clayton. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about Michigan's chances of beating Washington 
and winning the national championship this Monday night in Houston. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with a, uh, a stick, you know, and maybe say that I, I think there's a 60 percent chance if that's if that's kind of an acceptable answer, you know, to to put it into percentages. Uh, I do think Michigan's gonna win by a score or two, um, but I think it's gonna be pretty close throughout. And you know, it's kind of the, some of the things that we talked about, where I think Michigan can move the football, and I think that the Michigan defense should be able to hold up if they can avoid allowing some of those big plays. Uh, you know, you, you may allow 31. Uh, but, you know, that could mean a win as well against this Washington team. So mix things up, make sure that Michael Penix is, uh, has everything that you have thrown at him and, you know, then uh, let the chips fall where they may. But this team has talked about getting to this spot and capitalizing on it since a year ago at this time. And the fact that they're here, the fact that they did what they did in the Rose Bowl uh, is insane, you know, absolutely incredible. I mean, it doesn't happen – it never has happened. They've never gotten to a national championship game. So uh, enjoy this one to all the Michigan fans out there because it's been a special ride and uh, job's not finished. As they said, they've still got one more to go, and I think it's going to be a really, really fun game on Monday. With us today has been uh, Clayton Safey from the Wolverine Magazine and the Wolverine on 3. And, Clayton, I know you've got your bags packed and you are uh, heading down to Houston. It's going to be a lot of fun. Who knows? We might never get to do this again, so enjoy everything you do as far as the coverage uh, the player access uh, and of course the game on monday and thank you for your time and we'll be sure to have you on soon and we'll have as always a lot to talk about absolutely well appreciate you having me and uh enjoy the game On quick hits today, no injury updates so far this week. The teams will be down in Houston tomorrow, and there will be a flurry of media events as the hype grows and grows uh, each day until Monday. So we might get some news in the next few days. As I said at the top of the show, our schedule is like everyone else's covering uh, both teams, so that's why we're late in getting our shows up this week. Saturday, the Visitor's Edition will air, and our guest will be Huskies Radio Sideline reporter Elise Woodward. So make sure you join us. That will do it for now. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Enjoy this, because who knows if we'll ever get back to another championship game. We hope so, but we've waited a long time for this, and what a ride it's been. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go blue.